I'd like to hand over now to Terry here, Australian Chairman of Nuffield, to chair the morning session. Good morning again, and uh, well done, Snowy. And he delivers right on time. Certainly, the last week has whetted the appetite for today. We began with the uh, presentations from the incoming scholars, who have had inspirational visits organised by the panel and were all indebted to the South Australian alumni for what they had achieved. But I'm certain that all of that just whets the appetite further for the next session. Going into this next panel, we uh, I urge you just to note your questions. There will be ample time during the day to answer if you keep uh, have an opportunity to get your questions answered. And we'll be determined to stay on time. So, so it's my pleasure to introduce Julian Crew. Julian is the principal of Julian Crew and Associates, and they specialise in science communication. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. And from 1996 to 2002, he was the Director of the National Awareness for the CSIRO. Julian has been a journalist since 1969. And he's had numerous key scientific editorial posts <coughs> since then. He's received 32 awards for journalism including the Order of Australia Association Media Prize and five Michael Daly Awards for Science Journalism. His published work includes more than 7,000 print articles, 1,000 broadcasts, 50 media releases and 300 speeches. He teaches science communication at ANU and indeed is a powerful advocate for science. I ask you to welcome Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just make sure this is really working. It's a pleasure and a privilege to speak with you all today. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, we face the greatest challenge in human history. How to feed 10 billion or more people sustainably for more than half a century. In the first part of this talk, I'm going to explain some of the constraints, and you may find this a little confronting. In the second, I shall describe the tremendous opportunities which reinventing our food systems and diet hold for us and I trust you will find this both inspiring and motivational. Tonight, there will be 242,000 more people to dinner than there were last night. While growth is slow, the human population continues to grow to around 9 billion people in the 2050s, maybe 10, 11 billion thereafter. What they don't tell you is that the upper, the upper uh, estimates of the UN population forecasts are for 12 to 16 billion people. So it depends on your assumptions about how many babies third world women will be having by that part. In line with economic growth, consumers in China, India and Brazil and other advancing economies will be demanding more high quality food. In recent years, global food demand has risen nearly two times faster than production, driving the present record retail food prices. But by the 2060s, we will need twice as much food, around 600 quadrillion calories every single day. So my first point is that the central issue in the human destiny in the coming half century is whether we can achieve and sustain such a mighty harvest. My second point is that our food systems face critical limitations. Not just one or two, but a whole constellation of them, all playing into one another. There are emergent scarcities of just about everything we need to produce good quality food. 
water, land, nutrients, oil, technology, skills, fish, finance, and stable climates. Fix one and you sometimes make the others worse. So this is not a simple problem that can be easily solved with some new techno fix or national policy change. It is what is known as a wicked problem, a problem of vast complexity. For example, you heard uh, the, uh, the governor mention, um, by 2050, there are going to be about 7 to 8 billion people living in the world's cities. And those cities will consume as much water as the whole of irrigation agriculture does today. 2,800 cubic kilometres. At the same time, and I believe that this is something that has escaped popular attention so far, the global resources and energy sector is gobbling up water. It's going to demand more than twice its share of the world's water. We're seeing what's going on here in Australia with natural gas, um, with coal mining and so on, competing for the same aquifers that farmers use. Well, it's happening in America, it's happening in Canada, it's happening in China, it's happening everywhere, ladies and gentlemen. So, cities and energy corporations are already meeting their needs by taking the farmers' water. With little thought to how this is going to affect future food production or future food prices. Then there is the slice of farm water that climate change is already stealing. Rainfall over the world's great rain bowls, evaporation from soils and dams, windling lakes, shrinking aquifers, the loss of ice pack from mountain regions. By 2050, at least 6 billion humans will live in conditions of moderate to acute water scarcity. We know about those in Australia. And ladies expert. International Water Management Institute Dr. Director General Colin Chartres says current estimates indicate we will not have enough water to feed ourselves in 25 years time. Worldwide groundwater levels, lakes and rivers are dropping as they are pumped dry. Now look at Lake Chad, 90% gone in just 25 years. The Colorado River, the Murray Darling, you know, it's happening everywhere. The Himalayan glaciers are indeed disappearing. On the North China Plain, the North Indian Plain, in Midwestern America, groundwater is being mined at a rate that it will largely be gone in the next 15 to 20 years. These regions currently feed 2 billion people and they must feed 4 billion in the future. Today, humanity uses about 7,500 cubic kilometres of water a year. So that's, each one of us consumes an Olympic pool full of water every 30 months. The cup of coffee you enjoyed this morning took 14 buckets of water just to grow the beans. To put our fresh water consumption in perspective, over a lifetime, each one of us uses enough water to float that aircraft carrier there. Right? Seven billion aircraft carriers, you imagine that. So you can see that doubling global food production is not just a simple matter of doubling crop yields when the available water is likely to halve. As with water, so with land. Today, a quarter of the world's farmland is degraded, and there seems to be no let up in this process. We've made progress in Australia, America, Europe, and so on, but worldwide, the world is still losing 1% of its farmland every single year to a host of, of, of competing uses and to land degradation. We lose about 750 tonnes of topsoil a second. That's a clear warning that the present system for feeding the world is not sustainable in the long term. Now, if we've already lost 24% and we lose 1% a year from here on in, you can work out for yourself how much land your kids will have on which to double global food production. The FAO statistics, disturbingly, show that the area of land farmed worldwide has fallen in nine out of the last ten years. That's the little graph at the bottom left-hand corner there. Now this is in spite of high commodity prices and, and uh, all the things that you would think would encourage people to expand and open up more farming areas. The area is actually decreasing. It could be that we have already passed peak farmland. One of the reasons is this. By 2050, area of farmland buried under cities will equal the land mass of China. 
and the area of land buried under city recreational activity, all those horse farms and vineyards and uh, uh, day spas and holiday resorts and things like that, that will equal the land area of the United States. And this is all prime farm land, ladies and gentlemen, because cities are naturally located in river valleys and on coastal plains. An insidious aspect of this is that as you gobble up more and more land around the city, you thrust agriculture out into more remote and unreliable regions. You drive up its carbon emissions. You increase land degradation. You increase food insecurity because the rainfall is less reliable out there. Okay, so city development actually increases food instability. This is something that is not appreciated. But there's another issue which I think really has not been noticed. The world is building immense cities of 20, 30, and 40 million people. Okay, by the 2030s, Manila and Jakarta will both have populations larger than Australia's. Now, these cities do not any longer supply their own food. They rely upon a river of trucks coming every single night to restock the shops and the supermarkets. What will happen? if, due to an oil crisis, a local war, an economic crisis, a natural disaster, that river of trucks ceases to come, even for a few days. We know the answer to that because we saw it during the Queensland floods. The supermarkets in Noosa were empty within 48 hours, absolutely stripped bare. The modern metropolis cannot survive more than a few days without oil and without food. Besides rethinking farming, we need to rethink the city. The world is currently losing about 90% of its nutrients <clears throat> along the chain from farm to fork. On farm, you can misplace anything up to half your fertilizer. Another half of nourishment is lost in the food chain and in the waste disposal system. And this wastage is leaking into the environment and it's destroying lakes, rivers, even seeds. That beautiful green park, of course, you will recognise the Olympic yachting course uh, at the Beijing Olympics, you know, covered in algae, a simplified ecosystem where you can no longer catch fish because it's just been eutrophied. Modern civilization is dependent on finite nutrients mined from rock or from soil. There are no substitutes for these. No phosphorus, no food. Because these minerals are finite, they will sooner or later become scarce. Just when is currently a fierce debate among scholars. But like peak oil, peak phosphorus is lying in wait for humanity sometime this century. And when it happens, millions of farmers will be unable to afford fertiliser. Unless we find new sources of nutrients, food prices will skyrocket. We are Ladies and gentlemen, the first generation in history to throw away half our food. That picture shows you the USDA's estimate of the food trashed by the average American family every month. And it's the same for Australia, it's the same for Britain, it's the same for Europe. It's the same everywhere if you read the FAO report. In the third world, up to half the food is lost post-harvest to insects and molds. So half of the hard work of the world's farmers is going to landfill. When a billion people go hungry, we lose or throw away enough food to feed three billion. When a child dies of malnutrition, in five seconds. Our generation, it would appear, has lost its respect for food. We have lost our thrift. And thrift is a basic human survival strategy known to every generation of human beings going as far back in history as you care to go. I know what my grandmother would say. She would say we were stupid. And she'd be right. Global peak oil was in 2006, according to the International Energy Agency. It certainly happened in 50 out of 65 of the world's major oil regions, including, quite probably, Saudi Arabia. Yet 61 million new cars are hitting the world's roads this year. Now, whether the next oil crisis happens next week or next decade, it is going to happen, and it will have a huge impact 
on the cost of farming and the price of food worldwide. The modern food system depends critically on oil. Food prices and oil prices, as the graph shows, are inextricably locked together. Although interestingly, food prices are just overtaken oil prices. <clears throat> Globally, farm fuels are not a solution as they push up food prices. In theory, any, any one of you probably can grow enough fuel on your farm to run all your tractors and pumps and uh, other appliances. But that would cut, if all farmers did that, it would cut world food production by 10% right when we're trying to double it. And if you grew enough fuel to supply the trucks that take it to the cities, then that would cut world food production by 30%. Our governments and consumers seem blissfully unaware of the risk which global oil scarcity spells for global food security. I here call for an urgent global research program to convert farming systems to another energy source. Algal biodiesel maybe, or second generation biofuels, or hydrogen, or solar electrics. I don't mind what it is, but we need it now, we need to do it urgently, and we need, we need these technologies yesterday. None of them are actually ready to be used on the farm. Fisheries scientists say that a third of the world's fisheries have already collapsed and another 40% are in considerable trouble. It now looks as if peak fish happened in 2004. If you go to the FAO table, FAO basically says the maximum wild capture potential from the world's oceans has probably been reached. The dramatic expansion of fish farming, very exciting area that one, has so far managed only to maintain our not to actually increase it. Now, there are very great opportunities here, especially for countries like Australia. Uh, we, we could be producing megatons of fish uh, if we wanted to, but a major research effort is needed to develop the farming and ranching industries around that. Let me put this in an, an agricultural perspective by saying we probably are not going to get a, another 100 million tonnes of protein out of the sea. Okay? Even if we manage to sustain the present fish cap, we're not going to be able to double it. So we're going to have to get that 100 million tonnes of protein from land animals or from farmed fish. At the same time, FAO expects world meat demands to increase by 185 million tonnes by the mid-century. Okay, so you add those two figures together, we're going to have to find the equivalent of three more North Americas to grow all the grain necessary to feed all those animals. That gives you the challenge in a nutshell. It's just a way of putting it in perspective. We're going to have to find this extra food at a time when the climate in which agriculture arose is changing, maybe forever. Our crops and our farming systems are adapted to climates which are about to become extinct, is how Kerry Fowler, who runs the Svalbard Seed Bog, puts it. The UK's Hadley Centre projects that 40% of the planet could be in regular drought by the end of the century. Their soil moisture projection, that's the little green map, suggests that regions thought to have big farming potential, like Brazil, Southern Africa, and the Indian grain roll, may in fact be proving rather unreliable. Now, nobody knows what this means for food production yet, but the expert consensus at the moment seems to me around about a reduction of 25%. This is without adaptation. If we don't adapt, we will probably lose about 25% of the world's food production as the climate changes. So ladies and gentlemen, we have to run faster just to stand still. We're asking farmers to meet these challenges with less technology to help them do so. But worldwide, agriculture is driving into a big technology hotspot. And this is because national governments like ours here in Australia like Britain, like even New Zealand, America, Germany, France, you name it, they have all cut their investment in agricultural science. In the year 2000, the rich countries spent just 1.8 cents in every science dollar on food and agriculture. That is how unimportant they think this issue is. I'll give you a comparison. At the moment, the world spends around about $50 billion on agricultural R&D, public and private. That is roughly similar to what we invested 30 years ago when the world had half the number of people. 
and it compares with the current investment in weapons of 1.6 trillion US dollars every year. New weapons. To develop the sustainable eco-agriculture of the future and the sustainable healthy diet, we need massively more investment in food science and technology. We can easily afford this by investing a tenth of what we now spend on weapons. FAO says that to double global food production, we need to invest around about $90 billion a year for the next 50 years in agriculture. Unfortunately, globalised food chains are driving farm prices down everywhere, and globalised suppliers are driving farm costs up, and most farming worldwide is unprofitable. As FAO itself points out, nobody in their right mind is going to invest $90 billion a year in an industry that loses money. <coughs> Millions of farmers are recognising this and they are leaving the land. They are telling their children not to grow food. This process risks throwing one in five of the world's citizens out of work and out of their home. If we are going to double world food production, there must be, ladies and gentlemen, a fundamental change in the economics of agriculture. The current market signal is not to grow food. We need a market signal that tells us to grow food, that tells us to invest more, to, to use the best of the latest technologies. We must change that signal from a negative to a positive one. Okay, this then is the challenge facing the world in the next two generations. Not you perhaps, but your children, your grandchildren. <coughs> We need to double the global food supply with less water, less land, without fossil fuels, with more costly fertilisers and chemicals, with insufficient capital, and under the hammer of climate change. This is no doubt a daunting task. But we must not let ourselves be daunted, for it is also a magnificent opportunity or for all of those involved in food. It is the challenge of our age. It is a chance for all scientifically advanced countries to join in pioneering new farming and food production systems and a truly sustainable, healthy and delicious new cuisine. The reason is simple. If we fail, the consequences will affect every person on the planet. Modern wars are often driven by scarcities of food, land and water. Darfur, Rwanda, Eritrea, the Balkans, these were all destabilised by fights over these basic resources. Further back, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, both sprang out of bread prices. We know that hunger breeds war. The UK Ministry of Defence, America's CIA, the US Centre for Strategic and International Studies, the Oslo Peace Research Institute, all identify food scarcity as a trigger for revolution, government collapse and conflict. The riots that overthrew governments in Egypt and Tunisia earlier this year both began with a public outcry over food prices. Globally, food prices are around the highest level on record, peaking twice in three years. But the good news contained in this, ladies and gentlemen, is that many wars and government failures can also be avoided. How? By successfully meeting the world's need for sustenance. Investing in food and farming science is, in other words, defence spending. It merits equal priority. Recent refugees also, sorry, recent years have also witnessed a surge in the number of refugees uh, and legal immigrants. Uh, if you add these numbers together, you will see about a quarter of a billion human beings are on the march every single year now looking for new homes, looking for security looking for better places to live. A future famine in any significant region, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Central Asia or the Middle East, whether it's in, on the Indo-Gangetic Plains or the North China Plain, would displace tens, even hundreds of millions of people. They would go in all directions, ladies and gentlemen. There would be a tidal wave of refugees and early immigrants swamping other countries. So let us be in no doubt that solving global food insecurity is the challenge of our time. It is not just about solving our own situation. 
It is about solving the totality of food. We must never forget that big challenges contain huge opportunities. That we have solved similar problems before. We did this in the 1960s and 70s. Ladies and gentlemen, when Paul Ehrlich wrote the population bomb and forecast the end of humanity, basically six years later, MS Farmy Nathan and Norman Borg with a short straw wheats made India into a food service country. Amazing achievement. We've done it, we can do it. So what are the solutions? Here are some of the most important and the most exciting. To address these challenges, we basically need to reinvent the way we do three very important things. First of all, I would like us to combine the best ideas from farmers all over the world at light speed, using the internet. Whether these farmers are high-tech farmers, whether they are organic farmers. Let's stop this religious argument about who's got the best farming system. Okay? Let's share the ideas from all the systems and find out the ones that work best. Nuffield scholars, I bump into them everywhere. I bump into them in New Zealand, in Europe, in, in Australia. They're all in search of this, you know. They are all looking for this better. This is a, this is a fabulous organisation for developing these solutions. What you've got to do, ladies and gentlemen, is get those solutions into the hands of 1.8 billion farmers, because that's how many there are. Okay, we need a communication and outreach effort like we've never seen before, and today we have the tools to do it. We also need to create a new and healthy diet. One that treads less heavily on the planet and that doesn't actually kill half its consumers, unlike the present Western life. And we need to redesign our cities so that they recycle water and nutrients back into traditional and novel forms of food production. We've got to double the global investment in agriculture and food science. So I estimate $80 billion and I want to spend another $80 billion on the communication effort. Right? Because we're, we're great at coming up with solutions, but somehow they don't quite penetrate where they're needed, hence the African situation. This is going to be the greatest knowledge sharing effort in history, reaching not only farmers, but also all cooks, food processors, restaurants, and 8 billion consumers. <coughs> Using the internet, social media, and advanced communication systems, I believe this is completely feasible. But where's the money going to go? 160 billion. Sounds like a lot. Well, as I pointed out, it's one-tenth of the world's weapons spent. Just 10% of that would not only buy us food security, it would also buy us peace. It would decrease the tendency <coughs> to war. An easy way, an easy way to improve global food security is to end the colossal waste of half the food we currently produce by recycling nutrients at every point in the food and waste chain, that includes on farm. We need to green our cities, developing entirely new urban-based food production <coughs> systems, both large-scale and small-scale, high-tech and low-tech. So don't sneer at the people who are reinventing the victory gardens and the rooftop farms in New York and doing their little bit for food security. Uh, some of it's going to be very high-tech, as the artist's uh, impressions indicate. Some of it's going to be pretty basic and low-tech. People have a right to grow their own food, don't they? Um, I think that uh, if you have a, a farm with some beautiful green paddocks and cheap or moo cows on it, then you might well want to look at investing in a lovely green skyscraper with moo cows and sheep in it because, you know, uh, it's climate proof. <coughs> from anything else. Um, you know, this is, this is where we need to be very creative. We need to take our agricultural knowledge and not just apply it in rural landscapes but also urban landscapes. Uh, we, we need to do things like grow vast quantities of vegetables by hydroponic and aquaponic uh, methods. And I believe this urban permaculture, which I call it because it's the recycling of all of the, the, the major energy and water and nutrient flows in the cities, will become a major design element in cities in the future. But it's only, it's only just the beginning. So this is a very exciting revolution. Another dimension, and you may not like this one, is that we can, of course, turn those waste nutrients straight back into food by putting them into large steel reactors and growing microbes or fungi or plant cells or even animal cells, for the years of Dutch sausage um, and things like that. So, yes, it's possible, ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to feed those mega cities, I think we are going to have to do that. That diet can actually be a very healthy diet, incidentally. 
what we must have and have now is a world war on waste. Okay, not a war on terror, a war on waste. Let us design these new food systems and energy flows that do not waste, or if they waste, that then recapture what is waste and reuse it. We need to refashion the world diet to one that doesn't, in fact, kill half its consumers. Uh, this diet will be lighter, fresher, healthier, it will be vastly more diverse. It will contain far more plant foods and less high energy foods. We are at the brink of an explosion in food diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, your farms are boring in diversity, I'm sorry to say, compared to what they can be. There are 23,000 edible plants in the world. There are 6,000 edible plants in Australia. We currently farm five of them. Okay, we have not begun to explore the richness. Our diet is incredibly boring compared to what our Neanderthal ancestors no doubt picked up on the way as they wandered around. So this promise is a revolution not only in farming diversity, but a grand culinary adventure and a health adventure, a breakthrough for global sustainability. I believe some people will always want to eat meat, but with grain prices going very high and oil prices going very high, I suspect that livestock are going to go back to the rangelands, where using modern systems like precision pastoralism, we will actually revegetate, rehydrate, and recarbonize those vast tracts of the Earth's surface, managing them more wisely, more intelligently, managing them with a the kind of fingertip precision that a dairy farmer applies but on a huge scale. So future meat will be clean, healthy, organic, pasture-reared, and very expensive. Returning a better, a better price to the producer and engendering more respect from the consumer. I think we can also probably, if we need to, farm part of the deserts. There are good systems being worked on now for turning uh, salt water into fresh water using sunlight. Uh, so, you know, there's all sorts of agricultural possibilities that, that uh, we haven't yet embarked on. A lot of these were actually conceived with a, with a view to settling Mars, but I think we need them on planet Earth a little bit sooner than that. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to achieve all this, we have to reshape the attitudes of 8 billion consumers. These are people who live in cities and will never set foot on a farm. This calls for the world's most ambitious educational campaign, a full year, a food year in every junior school on the planet. A year in which every subject, maths, language, geography, science, society and sport, is taught through the lens of food. How precious it is, and how it is produced, where it comes from, how to eat it safely, thriftily, and healthily. How to help ensure it never fails. Teaching food is acceptable in all cultures, races and creeds. Teaching respect for food and how it is produced is equally so. The means already exist to share this knowledge worldwide. So I am calling on the farmers, the chefs, the food scientists and teachers to be leaders in this campaign, to engage the food processing industry, the supermarkets, the cookbook writers, the nutritionists, the TV chefs and the health departments to promote the same universal message. Eat well, but eat less. Eat more vegetables and less energy intensive foods. Choose foods that spare our soil and our water. Be happy to pay more for such good food so our farmers can safeguard the precious environment that produces it. My message today is that the challenge of doubling the world's food supply and then maintaining that doubling is great. But the opportunities that flow from it are greater still. By sharing knowledge globally and redoubling research, we can develop new science-based eco-farming systems. We can build healthier and more sustainable cities. We can build better diets, create better diets, and use a wider selection of the plants with which we are blessed on planet Earth. And we can pay farmers, fishers, and food producers a fair price so that they can safeguard the Earth that feeds us. Ladies and gentlemen, this is more than an inspiring challenge. It is one on which depend the future prosperity, security, stability, peace, and happiness of our civilization. Thank you.
Australia. Dave, most of us know you, but you can say who you are. Yeah, Dave Brownfield, um, Grain Farm Australia. Julian, I had a group of American farmers on my farm earlier in the year that growing corn for ethanol was their most profitable crop. I've just become a cotton grower, which is my most profitable crop. How do we solve that problem? Yeah, well, I think this is where we really do need to start talking to these guys who are globalising the food chain. <coughs> what farms grow, the, the, the options are narrowing because they're being driven by the markets. Um, this, this, this conversation has got to start. It's, it's a really serious thing because the industrialised food producing system is not producing a healthy diet for consumers. It's producing a cheap diet and a relatively safe diet, so it's good on, on those two points, but it's not producing a healthy diet. So that, that is a point that we need to start talking to. They cannot go on ripping the money, the capital out of agriculture um, and expecting it to keep on scaling up in supply. I mean, you know, when, when supermarkets shop around the world find the cheapest source of green beans or something like that, then uh, unfortunately, um, you know, they, they drive other green bean industries completely out of existence when they find a cheap one in Kenya or, you know, Tanzania or something. So, Somewhere along the line, we're going to have to have this hard economic conversation that the current, the current system is not going to cut the mustard as far as food sustainability is concerned. It's going to make some people very rich, I grant you that, um, but it's not going to help Canada as a whole. So, so this is where farmers' voices need to be heard on this one, and I don't think they are being heard. Anything like they are not enough. Consumers' voices need to be heard on this one, and they are not being heard loud enough. But, but, I, everywhere that I go, I hear from both groups their, you know, their, their rising concern over these things. You can't stop the American government pouring taxpayers' money into ethanol. I mean, ethanol is, is not a competitive field, as I understand it, in America. Were it not for you know, billions of dollars of taxpayer subsidy. I understand why America is doing that. I understand why America is putting $500 million into algae biodiesel for the military. Um, you know, they've got to find themselves some alternative energies that don't leave them beholden to the Middle East. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not good for food security. And you know, the, the answer is if those things keep on going, we're going to see more of those big food price spikes, and consumers are going to get more and more unsettled, and more and more governments are going to fall over. And sooner or later, politicians will get that message. Time for questions later. I'd like you to once again uh, try and do the last. <coughs>